Good morning, everyone. Good to see everybody. It's great to be here to worship uh, God together. And we're going to open now in prayer. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we just rejoice in all your goodness to us uh, through uh, Christ. Uh, we give you all uh, the praise and worship, Father, for uh, salvation is your plan from beginning to end. Uh, you are the one who calls us to faith in Christ, Father, and you are the one who keeps us uh, in your love and in the faith uh, until uh, Jesus comes again. Uh, Father, we just long to praise and worship you this morning and to lift our hearts to you. Help us to do that, Father, uh, to give you all of our attention uh, right now and to push out of our minds, uh, Father, all the distractions and uh, everything else that's been on our, our mind this past week. Help us to focus fully on you and to give you all the praise and honor and glory. In Jesus we pray. Amen. I make a team are going to lead us in praise and worship. Thank you. Good morning. Um, here's a new song. I think Liam put it on the system a couple of days ago. <clears throat> Maybe you've had a chance to listen to it. And it's, uh, what's the title of it, Kathy? There is one gospel. There is one gospel. Give me another word for, or another phrase for gospel. Good news. Good news. It's absolutely fabulous. We as Christians, we have good news. Jesus went into, at the start of his ministry, went into the synagogue in, in, uh, in Nazareth and he quoted from Psalm Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And he sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And after he had sat down, he said, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. We have good, if you listened to the news last night, it would not have been good news. But we, thankfully, are not of this world. We might be in it, but we're not of it. And we have good news. And we're going to celebrate that this morning in, in, in all the songs that we're going to sing. And please do meditate and concentrate on the words that we do sing because it does set out the good news it does set out the gospel very very clearly and what's involved in all of that hey uh, so kathy you're going to teach this song i'll try oh here i have something to do first before we do anything everybody give me a g did you know that george george Beatty down there is 90 years young today did you know that? God bless you, George. I'll never see the half of it. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you, George. Happy birthday to you. Come on, stand with us.
cast my mind to Calvary Will Jesus play and die for me I see his words, his hands, his feet My Savior on that cursed tree shall return in robes of white the blazing sun shall pierce the night and i will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on jesus face
manage it? I will sing of the goodness of God. Love your voice. You have led me through the fire. Darkest night, you are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life. Goodness is running after, running after me. Your goodness is running after, running after me. With my life laid down and surrendered now, I'll give you everything. Your goodness is running after, running after me. Your goodness is running after, running after me. Your goodness is running after, running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, running after me. Father, we rejoice in the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The good news that we can be saved from every sin, saved from death and, and hell, saved from an eternity cut off from all light and life and love and hope. And we rejoice that through Jesus, we are made citizens already of the eternal kingdom of God that is even now ready to be revealed on the last day of this world. And Father, the most amazing thing of all, perhaps, is that this is ours simply through faith in Jesus. And the gospel really is simple. And we do not have to climb up to heaven and bring it down, and we don't have to descend to the depths to bring it up from there, but salvation is near at hand. It is ours for the asking. Father, you are so gracious to us. You have done everything that's necessary for us to be saved, and we simply receive it by faith. It does not depend on us at all, but Lord Jesus, by your death and resurrection, uh, you have done everything uh, to clear our debt and make us uh, sons of God. Father, forgive us afresh, cleanse us anew, we pray. Father, renew us in our spirit. Uh, pour out your spirit upon us, Father, and draw us ever closer to Jesus. Make us more and more like him. May the fruit of the spirit be evident in our lives. 
love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Father, may these things be there and growing. Father, just thank you so much for all that you've done for us. Keep us, we do pray, Father, Father, until that day when Jesus comes again and we are caught up to meet him in the air as he comes. Father, what a day that will be. Father, we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, now, boys and girls, in just a moment, uh, you're going to be heading out to the Key to Life bus. Uh, so there isn't a children's talk here this morning, but uh, it's all going to be out there. Uh, but we thought we couldn't let you go without uh, singing uh, your children's song first, which is God is Love. So we're going to get you all standing up again, and we're going to sing, if that's all right. Yeah, here we go. Love the Lord with all your heart, all your mind, and all your strength. Oh, love the Lord. Oh, love the Lord. Love the Lord with all your heart, all your mind, and all your strength. Oh, love the Lord. Oh, love the Lord. This is what He is asking us to do. This is what He is. Zone and Sunday school, you're heading out now, and we'll see you back in later on. All right, now I have loads of announcements. Um, must be uh, a dozen, I'm sure. Um, election of new elders. Um, this, no, sorry, next Sunday is the last Sunday to get your uh, voting paper in. I think I announced last Sunday that it was this Sunday, but it's actually next Sunday. I'm running ahead of myself. So next Sunday is the last Sunday to get your paper in. The box is down there at the back. Uh, so uh, up to six names. Uh, they must be on the names that are on the voters list, any of those uh, six, uh, onto your, your seat in the box, please. And then, can I say a very, very big thank you to everybody who helped out with uh, Light Night, all the small groups uh, for all that you did, particularly to uh, Richard Henry and the members of the core team who uh, put it all together, and Paul and Lee who were manning the fireworks out there and uh, sending them all up into the air. So thank you everybody for making that, light, that, that night such uh, an amazing success. Yeah. 
latest edition of Evangelicals now is available, and so is this. Uh, it's called Queen Elizabeth II, the Queen He Chose to Serve. It was prepared for children. I think nearly every school child in the country has received one of these. Uh, there are extra copies out there in the foyer. If you want a copy for somebody, please take them with you. They're free. Uh, Diane, where's Diane? And then we have Kathy and Faith as well, so let me just take you in that order. Is this mic on? Good morning, everyone. I won't keep you too long now. Even more my trainers so I could get up fast. Can you believe 56 days until Christmas now? 56. Yeah, I thought I'd brighten up your morning. I'm here to tell you this morning about the shoebox appeal. Whenever you turn on the TV or listen to the radio, I just feel there has never been as big a need for shoeboxes as this year. Whenever you look at all those kids that have just left, you just wonder, imagine waking up with no Christmas presents. It's so sad. So, folks, it's easy to choose gifts for people who have so little. A pair of socks, a notepad, some crayons, the things that we take for granted are luxury items for people living in poverty. By filling a shoebox this year, you'll bring in hope to someone at Christmas. Shoeboxes are delivered to vulnerable people in Ukraine, Albania, Bulgaria, Hungary, Kosovo, Moldova, Romania and Serbia. And you've been hearing a lot about those, some of those different countries this year. I look around our society today and we have so much, we are so well off that we take things for granted. Please bring happiness to some child, adult or elderly person in the world this Christmas. In John 15 verse 12 it says, my command is love each other as I have loved you. So I would love to see a good lot of shoeboxes. Now I do know that it's in schools as well, but just if somebody's feeling they could just give to somebody this Christmas, feel free and bring them in. It's not next Sunday, but the next one. Don't even know my dates, I'm away with them. Thank you. Morning, everybody. I just want to do a wee quick announcement about our facilities for um, under um, school, primary school age children. And it's on the sheet, but I just wanted to um, stand up and just um, explain it a wee bit as well. So because we have so many children now, it's great. Um, we're going to have to split them up a wee bit more just so that we have enough room for everybody and so that we're covering ourselves just with the child to adult ratios that we have to cover for taking care. So just uh, the, t the take top zone, which was, we, we called it toddler crash before, we call it, we're going to call it top zone now, it's going to be like a preschool, um, Sunday school class, so it's still going to be in the annex, but it will be for three and four year olds that um, haven't started school yet, or haven't started nursery yet, and we have a rota of volunteers that are going to be looking after them, and we're going to be uh, following along with kids zone stories as well, just so that um, it get, brings them into that a bit more and prepares them for Sunday school too then. And then the creche, which is in the room just at the back right there, it's going to be for under threes who are up on their feet, um, just with a wee, the wee toddlers really. And we have a row of volunteers who have come forward. And thank you very much for those who have come forward for that. We were, um, we were really bowled over by the amount of people that wanted to help out with that as well. And um, toddler crash, um, sorry, tot zone and crash are going to be um, just going out at the same time as the kids go out to kids zone, just because we want it, we want them in the service at the start as well, um, just to experience church as well. But obviously, if parents need to go out with a screaming child, they can and wait until the supervision comes before they escape. Um, and also, if there's any young people who are past um, Bible class age that would like to help us in crash or in um, tot zone come and speak to either myself or Sharon Moffat and let us know. We would love to have you involved as well. And the last announcement then is we're, we're going to create a wee bit of a baby room. So for the kids that are um, not up on their feet yet and the parents, just a wee place for them to be able to take their children out um, of the service. It's going to be in the book room or the library, just um, in between the hall and the church here. We're going to um, change it around a wee bit to make it more comfortable for the babies as well. Okay, thank you. I'll never again to wear my trainers, Diane. <laughs> so um, just a quick message about the ladies um, Ballydown Women's Group. Um, if you haven't heard of it already, um, we have a 
sheet at the back of the, the hall or the church today. And if you haven't heard of it or if you haven't put your name down, please do take a moment to put your name and number down on the sheet at the back. This is a group where we as women in Ballydown Presbyterian can get together, get to know each other better, support each other, build each other up and just have really good fun together. Um, and that's so exciting to think how God could then use that group of women here in our church and in our community. Um, so you will have, if you're already in the group, you will have received a text this morning about our first event. Um, we're meeting on Saturday the 26th of November here in the church hall and it's going to be a lovely evening of Christmas craft making ceramics um, with um, Roberta from At The Clay House. So if you'd like to get involved get on the text because the numbers are growing and we may have to limit it, um, hopefully not, but if you are interested, please do text us um, and let us know your interest. And the other thing then, there are a large number of ladies in this WhatsApp group and we don't want this to be a ping, ping, ping that's always on your phone. So just to highlight um, that you can mute this group. So if you see a text come through, you respond to it. If you aren't aware, on WhatsApp, there is a facility to mute it for eight hours or seven days. So if you just hit the top where it says the name Ballydown Women's Group, and it'll bring up a facility there to press mute. So we want you to stay in this group. We don't want it to, um, to be something that's always ping on your phone. Um, so this is a group where we'll let you know about future events. You can put them in the diary, um, and then we look forward to seeing you there. And finally, I'd just like to say, look, as a church, please do pray for this group. Um, for this group of women. Um, pray for the fellowship, um, pray for fun, but pray that it will be a blessing to us here in Ballydown Church and in our community, and just pray that God will be glorified through it too. Thanks. Thanks, Faith. Now, Warren, went ahead. Your video, we can put the video up, actually, Neil. Uh, so, my name's Tony. I'll be coming over sharing my story. I wrote a book a couple of years ago on, on the, my, my life, um, but more importantly, three years that, that, that happened to me that was really powerfully supernatural that led me eventually into the truth. Uh, I was a career criminal for many, many years and I ended up in the Peruvian jungle looking for redemption, looking for a hope, really, that would set me free. I wanted, you know, I wanted to better myself, I wanted, didn't, didn't like the man I'd been, you know? And uh, anyway, I got further roped into uh, witchcraft. I came back to London and I was terrorised for three years spiritually. Uh, but anyway, look, it ends well. Not, I won't go too much more into it. It's great when guys come together. It's a, it's a wonderful dynamic. It's powerful. It's where my heart is. I love coming together with guys. And uh, we, we need to sharpen iron, sharpen iron. And, we, and us guys need to stick together. So really looking forward to meeting you and, and having a chat with all of you on the night. God bless you and keep going. And that's Tony Maisie. Um, the first part of the video actually is missing, but uh, it's, he's coming over next week. Um, going to be staying with me for a few uh, speaking engagements, but he's going to be coming to our Fight Club group, uh, Men's Fellowship, this coming Tuesday, the 1st of uh, November. It's open. We're going to open it up to all men of 18 plus. Um, he has an amazing true story of his life story in this book called Inside War. Um, He's, you're going to hear, you know, basically a lot of stuff. He's touched a wee bit on it there, but by God's grace, he was saved out of a life of crime, underworld crime in London, and yeah, got in so, involved in some very oppressive and uh, demonic type stuff. But the Lord's good and uh, saved Tony out of all that, and now he's led him into full time men's ministry. So that's this Tuesday night. And then just a final reminder about uh, the regular Joe's Men's Conference. Um, it's happening in Carn Money Presbyterian Church this coming Saturday, the 5th of uh, November. Um, guest speakers will be John Eldridge, um, who we're studying a book in, his, in Fight Club at the moment. He's also the author of Wild at Heart. And also Rico Tice, who um, developed the Christianity Explored course. Some of us have been on that over the years in Ballydown. So that's next Saturday, the 5th of November, kicking off at 9 o'clock. There are still tickets available. There's a sign-up sheet if anybody wants to see me. Um, I'll be getting those all organized this week. We're planning to meet for breakfast first thing. So anybody that has signed up, we're going to the Rosehip Cafe in Bambridge at 7 a.m. to start 
the day off with a good Ulster fry, and then we will be you know, pulling cars then together to head down to, to Belfast. So please keep in touch. Let me know if there's any last-minute additions for tickets. That's this Saturday, uh, the 5th of November. Regular Joes. Thanks so much. Okay, Alson. Alson Hutchinson. Morning, everyone. Um, I would like to ask Isabel Moorhead, Jane McKee, um, Sharon Smith um, to come up on stage, please. And also Beth Cherry, who is representing her mum, Alison Cherry. So I'll just give the ladies a couple of minutes to just come on up. So as many of you will know, these ladies have volunteered for many years with guiding in Ballydown. Um, Isabel and Alison have been involved in brownies and Jane and Sharon with rainbows. Um, they're now all moving on to new things. And although I'm sure they'll all keep serving in Ballydown in many ways, um, we just wanted to recognise the contribution that they've made over the years um, to guiding. Being a volunteer in guiding is certainly rewarding, but it can be hard work. It's not just turning up to the meetings. It's also all the preparation and admin that happens behind the scenes. Um, so we're really grateful for everything that they've done um, over the years. So on behalf of the girls, um, the parents, and all the other leaders in guiding in Ballydown, I just wanted to pass on our sincere thanks for everything that they've done and the many hours of service that they've given over the years. So thank you all very, very much. This isn't Alison Cherry, as you'll be aware. <laughs> but Beth is stepping in, okay. That's on. okay. <laughs> and finally, uh, instead of Prime Ministry over to your left, uh, today, uh, three members of the prayer ministry team will come up here at the end after I pronounce the benediction. And whoever wants, to, wants prayer, just please come up to the front, say what you want prayed for, and they'll pray with you, okay? There'll be some music play in the background by the team, so you'll not only overhear what's being prayed for you. It's just a different way of trying prayer ministry to try and encourage more folk to avail of it, so that'll be there at the, at the end, okay? Thank you. Now let's again come to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you because you are the God of the whole earth, Lord. You are the one who has created everything, and your plan is working out, Father, uh, across this world. You're drawing people to yourself. And we thank you, Father, that uh, even though there are terrible things going on in our world today, still, Father, you are building uh, your church. And Lord Jesus, you promised that uh, you will build your church and the gates of hell will not uh, prevail against it. And we claim that promise. Father, we thank you that there are many uh, believers in uh, the country of Ukraine right now, Lord, and they are clinging on to you, clinging on to your word, Father, and we pray that they will continue to cling on in spite of all the hardships that they're facing right now and the lack of electricity and the bombs falling and everything else. And for all those who are refugees, millions of them, Lord, 
uh, scattered across Europe and even in our own country. Father, keep your hand on them, and we cry out with them, Lord, that this war will soon come to an end, and that those who are responsible for bringing all this uh, calamity on Ukraine will be held to account. Father, we remember those uh, families in South Korea uh, today uh, who have been bereaved in that uh, terrible crush. We pray, Father, for our brothers and sisters in Christ in, in Seoul, Father, as they seek to uh, minister and bring help and hope to those families, Lord, give them strength. We thank you, Father, uh, for our students in training uh, through PCI. And we have Scott uh, with us, Father. We pray, Father, that they will all be grounded in your word through what they learn. We pray, Father, for the right uh, people to come forward uh, into the ministry, Father, called by you and gifted uh, to preach uh, your word. Uh, we do pray, Father, for our children as they have gone out uh, right now. We thank you and praise you for this amazing resource that uh, is there, a Key to Life, Father, and how it has been used uh, to present the gospel to hundreds of children. And Lord, as our own children uh, experience that this morning, may they really understand the gospel message and receive Jesus themselves. We thank you, Father, also for how well the light night went and the hundreds of people who came, Father. And we ask, Lord, that it will be a witness and a testimony to them. And for the men's meeting, Father, that happened uh, just two weeks ago, we thank you, Lord. And we pray that we can keep uh, that ministry uh, moving forward also, Lord. Give us wisdom, Father, as we choose new elders. Uh, we pray, Father, for the right people. Uh, we know how important, Father, leadership is in our uh, church and across our denomination. So, Father, we pray uh, that you will uh, raise up and call uh, the right people, the men of your choice. Father, for all who are at home today and who wish that they and who long to be here, Father, we pray. We ask, Lord, that they will know your presence as they watch on online later. We pray, Father. Uh, for those who are, are sick and struggling, bereaved, Father, that they will experience just the touch of your hand upon their lives. Father, thank you uh, that you look upon us in our weakness, Father, and you are concerned and you always uh, draw near uh, to your people when they ask. So, Father, we do ask. Father, you are so gracious and good to us and we praise you for that and for all that you have done for us in Jesus. Amen. I should have said prayer and praise is on this evening at 7.30, so please do come to that. We have so much to give thanks for uh, that the Lord has, has done uh, these past uh, few weeks. Now let's turn to God's Word. Uh, we're continuing our series, uh, Prepared to Serve, and we're going to read uh, from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter uh, 12 and down into uh, chapter 13. Okay, 1 Corinthians 12, uh, we're just going to start at verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And in the church, of God, in the church God has appointed, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then workers of miracles, also those having gifts of healing, those able to help others those with gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But eagerly desire the greater gifts. And now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. 
love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. We're on the second part of our course, um, our PCI course, Prepared to Serve, which is on spiritual uh, gifts. Our title for today is Following the Giver's Instructions, uh, Biblical Teaching on Gifts. Last week we said that all these gifts are for the common good. We saw in the first part of 1 Corinthians 12 how Paul appealed to the Lordship of Christ as the starting point for this subject, and how he went on to appeal to the Trinity to emphasize the diversity and the unity of the body. So that while there may well be and are lots of gifts, they are not to be used for ourselves, but for the good of the whole body, that is, for the common good. Now, this morning we start by asking a very basic question, what is a spiritual gift? What does the Scripture tell us? And then following on from that, what is the difference between spiritual gifts and natural abilities? And then a third question, what is the difference between spiritual gifts and the fruit of the Spirit? And for my money, the third of those questions is the most important. So first of all, what are spiritual gifts? We're going to have to do a little bit of uh, biblical detective uh, work here, so bear with me. I'll put all the references I'm using uh, on the screen uh, so that you can follow along uh, more easily. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 1 reads in the NIV, Now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. But actually the word gifts is not there at all. It should read, Now about spirituals, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. There's an adjective there and there's no noun, which is why the NIV adds in the word gifts, but it's not actually there in Paul's Greek. It's not there at all. Likewise, at chapter 14, verse 1, which says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire, the NIV says spiritual gifts, but the gifts is not there, eagerly desire spirituals, especially that you might, and the NIV says, have the gift of prophecy, the word gift isn't there again especially that you might uh, prophesy. The NIV inserts the word gifts twice. It's not there in Paul's Greek. Again, also 14 verse 2. Since you are eager to have spiritual gifts, but the word gifts isn't there. Since you're eager to have spirituals, says Paul, try to excel in those that build up the church. Again, NIV gifts twice, but it's not actually there. So what's going on? It turns out that Paul doesn't actually use the phrase spiritual gifts anywhere in 1 Corinthians at all, not in the whole letter. And yet here we are following a course in spiritual gifts. So what's going on? Good question. Chapter 12, verse 4, Paul writes, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. And the word gifts there is this famous word charismata. You recognize the start of that, the word charis. Uh, You maybe know someone who is called charis. Charis means grace. Charismata are simply grace gifts in the plural. Okay? This word charismata appears seven times in 1 Corinthians. It never appears alongside the word spiritual. Now, you could point to 1 Corinthians 1, 7, where it says, Paul writes, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly await for the Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. But the word spiritual has been added by the NIV, and it's not actually there. And the word gift in that sentence is this word 
charismata, grace gift. Okay. You do not lack any grace gift. You do not lack any charismata as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ is what he says. The only other place the word grace gift appears is in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Apart from chapter 12, I mean. 1 Corinthians 7. Each man has his own gift or charismata from God. One has this, another has that. But what's Paul talking about in that verse? He's talking about marriage and singleness. <laughs> marriage and singleness are grace gifts. And therefore, both believers and unbelievers receive grace gifts from God. Okay? The remaining five occurrences of grace gifts are all in 1 Corinthians uh, uh, 12, for example. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 30. Do you all have gifts of healing? Uh, verse 31, but eagerly desire the greater gifts. Gifts in both those verses is charismata. What do we learn? It seems that while Paul wants to talk to the Corinthians about spiritual gifts, and this is one of the questions that they have asked him, he would much rather use the word grace gifts. So what are spiritual gifts? Spiritual gifts, quite simply, are grace gifts. They are all gifts of God's grace. And that's what Paul is saying right through this whole letter. Everything we have and are is a gift of God's grace. And we need to establish that point very clearly. I love 1 Corinthians uh, 4, 7. Um, oh, I'll put it up there, right? What do you have that you did not receive? That's the unanswerable question. What do you have that you did not receive? Uh, sit down and think about that someday. Uh, take a blank sheet of paper. Maybe someday that you're struggling to come to God in prayer. Sit down and try to answer that question. You'll be cured in five minutes. God does not owe us anything. God is no man's debtor, and therefore, everything that we have and everything that we are is a free gift of God's grace. That is never anything that we have earned by our good works. Uh, Paul makes that clear also in Galatians 3, by the way, and Paul is on the war path when he writes these words, Galatians 3, verse 1, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. And he says to him, I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Have you suffered so much for nothing, if it really was for nothing? Does God give you His Spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the law or because you believe? Paul is going through them for a shortcut when he writes that paragraph. Does God give you a spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the law? That is, because you're all such good boys and girls, or because you've tried ever so hard, because you're a cut above the rest? No, none of that. But because you believe. Spiritual gifts are grace gifts, and that's what Paul prefers to call them. And we must bear this in mind because it will keep us humble. It's easy to get away, carried away with gifts and with service, and there's nothing like serving the Lord to swell your head. Pride is deadly, and we must avoid it at all cost. Spiritual gifts, they're all from God, they're all of grace, they're nothing that we deserve. Don't ever let go of that. Spiritual gifts, what are they? They are grace gifts. Next question. What's the difference between spiritual gifts and natural abilities? It's tempting to put those two things into separate uh, watertight compartments, but it's not that simple. Obviously, both natural abilities and spiritual gifts are grace gifts, all of them. Uh, back to 1 Corinthians 4, 7 again. What do you have that you did not receive? Do you have a gift of music? Where did that come from? That's the gift of God. Do you have a gift for art? Where did that come from? From the Lord. Do you have a gift for hospitality? Where did that come from? Well, from the Lord. And we could go on all day and list every kind of spiritual gift and natural ability 
and they are all God's gifts to us. This is why Paul can call marriage and singleness also grace gifts, as well as gifts of healing and miracles. And then they all have the same purpose, which, as we discovered last week, is for the common good. And while this is true of the body of Christ, obviously, it's also true in the broad sense of the common good of all of humanity. This is why God gives grace gifts to believers and unbelievers alike. And so they receive grace gifts of marriage and singleness, of leadership and hospitality and so on for the good of humanity as a whole. Believers and unbelievers receive the grace gifts of music, art, ministration, all these kinds of things, and this is for the benefit of the whole of society. All of the gifts, whether natural or spiritual, develop with use. Paul writes to Timothy, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. That's 2 Timothy 1.6. Paul did not want Timothy to sit on his hands to neglect the gift that he had been given. And in all of our gifts, both natural and spiritual, need to be used uh, like, like a muscle. They need to grow strong with use. This is why, obviously, uh, someone with the gift of music needs to practice. Someone with the gift of leadership needs to lead in different settings and learn from their mistakes. Someone with a gift of teaching needs to be given opportunities to teach and develop their gift. What we must avoid at all costs is burying our gift, like the third man in the parable of the talents. He was given one gift, he buried it, and he handed it back to the Lord unchanged. And the Lord called him a wicked, lazy servant, and he threw him out. So, spiritual gifts and natural abilities have a great many things in common. And yet, at the same time, there are differences. The one set, obviously, are natural and the other spiritual or supernatural. You only have to read through 1 Corinthians 12, 7 to 11 to see a list of gifts that are very different from natural abilities. They are the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit, such as words of wisdom and of knowledge of faith and healing and so on. And then I was asked this question on the way out the door last week. Are the gifts we have static, meaning whatever gifts we have now, is that it? Our natural abilities, I think, we have from birth and are static, but spiritual gifts, as far as I can see, may be added to. I mean, why else does Paul write, eagerly desire spiritual gifts if we have all the gifts uh, that we need? It makes no sense. Or as Paul wrote to Timothy, as we already uh, heard, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. We don't know what that particular gift was, but if gifts may be given through the laying on of hands, then they can certainly be given at different times in our lives. So, what's the difference between spiritual gifts and natural abilities? For me, the similarities are greater, actually, than the differences. They're all uh, grace gifts. They are all for the common good. They can all be developed with use, and yet they're different in that they are both natural and supernatural. Natural gifts, I think, are static, what we receive from birth whereas our spiritual gifts may be added to, and indeed we are to seek uh, spiritual gifts, says Paul. Next question then, and this is the third one, and the last one. Spiritual gifts and the fruit of the Spirit, what's the difference between those? For example, Paul in Galatians 5, uh, 22, he lists uh, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Whereas the gifts of the Spirit are things like prophecy and serving, and teaching, and encouraging, giving, leadership, showing mercy, and so on. What's the difference? The fruit of the Spirit has to do with character, whereas gifts have to do with ministry. That's the difference. Fruit is about who we are. Gifts are about what we do. Now, which is more important, who we are or what we do? It's who we are. You see, there's a reason why Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 13 in the middle of this discussion. Three chapters he wrote, chapters 12 to 14, but in the middle of it, he talks about love. Paul did not write 1 Corinthians 13 to be read at weddings. He really didn't. (laughs) He wasn't talking about marriage. He was talking about spiritual gifts. Listen to what he says at chapter 13, verse 1. 
If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. Look at the gifts Paul mentions in those three verses, tongues, prophecy, knowledge, faith, and giving. And none of them amount to anything without the fruit of the Spirit, which is love. The fruit of the Spirit in our lives will determine the effectiveness of the gifts and talents that God has given us. Lack of love, lack of self-control, lack of patience can easily destroy a ministry and destroy what good we are trying to do with the gifts that God has given us. Another important difference is this. No one has all of the gifts. That's the point of what Paul is saying there at the end of 1 Corinthians 12. He asks the question, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers? And the answer to all of those questions is no. But all of us are to have all of the Spirit's fruit because it's really one fruit of the Spirit. And there are no opt-outs. No one can say, well, patience is not my fruit or self-control or faithfulness or any of them. So, we have different gifts according to what God has given us, but we all must display all of the fruit of the Spirit. This brings us to some very, very important questions on this particular point. Are spiritual gifts evidence of spiritual maturity? Answer, no. Look at the life of Samson. That man was given a great gift of superhuman strength for the good of his people and for their deliverance from their enemies, but look how he lived. He squandered his gift on chasing women, and his weakness cost him his life. King Saul, whom we studied last year, was given great gifts of leadership, and he led his people with great success in their military campaigns. But he squandered his gift of leadership because he did not have the fruit of patience to wait for the Lord as Samuel told him to wait. And perhaps you can think of people with exceptional gifts, great gifts of organization and leadership, but who are so impatient and intolerant of failure that they're hard to live with. We struggle sometimes with the people God uses. This is because great gifts and the fruit of the Spirit do not necessarily go hand in hand. They should. In an ideal world, they would. But we are still sinners, and very often they don't. Whatever you do, do not make the mistake of thinking that the gifts you have make you a more spiritual person. They do not. That's hard to take in, but it's the truth. We are not any more spiritual for having great gifts or few gifts or many gifts. It doesn't work like that. It is the fruit of the Spirit that shows us a spiritual person, not the gifts. The fruit of the Spirit is what enables us to speak the truth in love. It is the fruit of the Spirit that enables us to be patient with those that we work alongside. It is the fruit of the Spirit that enables us to remain faithful in our mar- to, in our, to our marriage partner and so on. This is why it's also a great mistake to take someone who has, say, let's, let's say, a great gift for teaching and thrust them into the ministry too quickly. They need time to develop the fruit of the Spirit in their lives so that they have the maturity to handle their gift. Next question. Do spiritual gifts guard us against sin? Again, no. King David was blessed with incredible gifts. Think of his gifts of leadership and how he organized and ran a nation. Gifts of music and wrote all those psalms and arranged them and appointed leaders to lead worship. Think of his gifts of prophecy and how he foresaw the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and wrote those psalms about it. He had truly amazing gifts, yet those gifts did not stop him from committing adultery and murder. And you could add to that list Most of the great men of God, like Elijah and Abraham, Moses and and Solomon, all gifted individuals, and yet every one of them at one point or another fell and stumbled into sin. Their gifts, great as they were, did not prevent them from falling. It's the fruit of the Spirit, not the gifts. It's the fruit that guards us against sin. The fruit of peace in our hearts is what will prevent us from coveting what is not ours. 
It is the fruit of faithfulness and of self-control that will keep us from sexual sin and from addictions of all kinds. It is the fruit of love and kindness that will save us from self-centeredness and greed and so on. Next question. Are gifts evidence of salvation? No. That's a scary statement. Matthew 7, 15, Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says this, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, not by their gifts, by their fruit, you will recognize them. False prophets, people with a gift of prophecy and yet entirely false. By their fruit, not their gifts, you will recognize them. It is the fruit of the Spirit that shows us a saved person, not marvelous gifts. Jesus went on to say this, Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Jesus mentions gifts there, gifts of prophecy and casting out demons and performing miracles, and yet he says to them, I never knew you. Remarkable gifts, incredible gifts, but Jesus said, away from me. There are people in this country who will offer you charms for your ailments. They're called faith healers. We don't believe in faith healing. We believe in divine healing, healing that comes from God through Jesus Christ in answer to prayer. Possessing spiritual gifts is no proof of spirituality. It is not even proof of salvation, according to the Lord Jesus Christ himself in the Sermon on the Mount. As evidence of that, consider Balaam, the false prophet, who was hired to curse God's people and God rebuked him through the mouth of a donkey. Consider also the slave girl in Philippi, Acts 16, verse 16. We were going to the place of prayer. We were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. What kind of spirit is that? It seems to be on Paul's side. It seems to be on the side of the gospel. These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. Or is this a satanic deception? Verse 18, she kept this up for many days and finally Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the Spirit left her. You see, Paul worked it out. It was Satan masquerading as an angel of light. The proof of salvation is not in the gifts, but in the fruit. Matthew seven sixteen. by their fruit, you will recognize them. We have covered a lot of ground today, and probably by now your brain is fried. Uh, we have discovered that spiritual gifts, along with natural abilities, they are all grace gifts, that famous word charismata. Even marriage and singleness are the gifts of God's grace. Of course they are. And all of our gifts are to be used for the common good. They're not to be spent on ourselves, as it were. We're to use them to serve one another. And we are to make sure that we develop our gifts and fan them into flame. So let your gifts that God has given you, after all, let them grow. Use them. That's why the Lord gave them to you. Let them develop. And like a muscle, they grow stronger with use. And then we must recognize the central importance of 1 Corinthians 13 and all of this discussion because the fruit of the Spirit is what enables us to use the gifts in the right way, that is, with wisdom and maturity. Next time, we're going to examine what all these individual gifts are and what, what they do. Let's pray. Father, we praise you that you have given gifts to your church. And these are, and you have prepared works in advance for us to do uh, with these gifts. Father, uh, you are so good. You call us into all sorts of different spheres of service and you equip us with the gifts for, for doing these things. And we see today, Father, the crucial importance of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. 
Help us to live as Paul instructs there in 1 Corinthians 13, Father. Love is patient, love is kind, does not envy, does not boast, is not proud. Father, help us to live like this. And so make use of these wonderful gifts that you have given us in the right way. Father, we humbly ask it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, Mike and the team are going to come back and lead us in our closing worship. Just to remind you of tea and coffee after the service, if you're a visitor, please uh, stay. Um, Coffee either in the main hall, straight through the back, or in the foyer. And prayer ministry today, just a little bit different. Um, I've asked three of the uh, team to come up. They'll stand here at the front. And if you want prayer for anything, please uh, do come up. There'll be music playing in the background, so uh, no one will overhear. Okay, thank you. I'm standing on it. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, saint that thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence, my life. Be thou my wisdom, be thou my true word. Thou with thee, and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, and I thy true heaven. Thou in me dwelling, and I in thy care. Be thou my breastplate, my sword. For the fight, be thou my armor, and be thou my might. Thou my soul shelter, and thou my high tower. Raise thou me heavenward, O power of my power. I King of heaven, when victory won, grant heaven's joy to me, O bright heaven sun, Christ of my own heart, whatever before, still be my vision. Let us all say together the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Oh